Warning, this episode contains brain food that will lead to improved emotional and social intelligence. Give us one hour and we'll help you change the way you think about happiness. Harvesting Happiness with Lisa Cypress Cayman is fresh, optimistic, and purpose-driven media that promotes well-being from the inside out. Each week, Lisa spotlights diverse trendsetters and change agents who are the greatest contemporary thinkers and doers, devoting their lives to creating a better world in which to live. Your host, Lisa Cypress Cayman, is a widely recognized applied positive psychology expert, author, documentary filmmaker, and lecturer specializing in optimal lifestyle management. Let's get to it. Here's Lisa. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Thanks for joining us on today's show, where you will learn how exercise is the wonder drug. Move the body, heal the brain. My first guest is Dr. Jennifer Heise who is an expert in brain health. She is associate professor in the Department of Kinesiology at McMaster University and directs the NeuroFit Lab. Dr. Heiss received her PhD in cognitive neuroscience at McMaster and completed a postdoctoral fellowship in brain health and aging at the Rotman Research Institute at Baycrest Hospital in Toronto. Her research examines the effects of physical activity on brain function to promote mental health, and cognition in young adults, older adults, and individuals with Alzheimer's disease. She is the author of Move the Body, Heal the Mind, Overcome Anxiety, Depression, and Dementia, and Improve Focus, Creativity, and Sleep. And I'm going to add another tagline, but you don't really need it, Jennifer, mm-hmm. and like having a better life. <laughs> having a better life, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Living my best life. <laughs> yes, living living the dream. Move your body, live the dream. There's your next book. Yeah, <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Thanks for joining me on the show today. Oh, my pleasure. Let's talk about exercise and why people find it so darn difficult to be consistent with it. Mm-hmm. Not yeah. me, not you, mm-hmm. but pe- yeah. <laughs> but people. Yeah, I mean, exercising is hard. It's hard work. It It is work by definition. And if you're not in a habit of exercising regularly, like you and I, it can be really difficult to break through that, just that initial inertia to develop the habit. And this is not your fault. This is actually the brain's fault. We can blame the brain. It's hardwired to conserve energy. And essentially this means it makes us lazy. And so If we think back to when the brain evolved, it was at a time when we had to expend a lot of energy to hunt and gather our food. Nowadays, we don't have to, but the brain is still wired to conserve that energy. And it sees any extravagant exercise, any voluntary exercise as an extravagant expense. And so it goes out of its way to try to talk you out of it. Like, Ah, oh, do we even have time to exercise? You're so tired. Exercising is hard. And so it has this like, you know, this ticker tape of of rebuttals against exercise that play on in the background. And if you're if you're not used to it, it can really derail your best intentions to exercise. Wow. Uh, I, you know, I never thought of it from that perspective as the the brain playing tricks on you mm-hmm. to 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 keep you more sedentary, to reserve that energy for things that are needed, like threats. Exactly, exactly. And so there are ways, fortunately, to get around that. And one of my go tos is it's so simple. Just put it in the calendar ahead of time. So you block it off in your calendar, and you include details like what you're going to do, when, with whom, and it takes out the guessing game. So it's not no longer an impromptu meeting. You don't have to just try to find time to fit it in. And it also gives you ammunition against this lazy brain's appeals. So the brain might say, do you even have time for this? And you can say, yeah, it's like, (laughs) it's right there in my calendar. And then if your brain, you know, complains, well, exercising is hard and we're tired. And you say, well, you know, my plan for today is not that hard. So you can kind of, if you plan ahead, you can get around these rebuttals by the brain and it makes it a little bit easier. 
So calendaring exercise, right? Exercising mm-hmm. with a friend, right? Mm-hmm. Buddy system. That's another way. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The importance of social engagement, interaction, and this has added benefit, not only of motivating you to exercise, because when we do things with people we like, we get that boost of dopamine in our brain that helps us feel good. And then we start linking those feel good feelings, not just with the friends that we're exercising with, but with the exercise itself. So the exercising neurons start to fire with the fun neurons and it starts to we start to link the two up in our brains. Let's talk a little bit about exercise and mental health cuz mm-hmm. prior to us you know doing the interview we were speaking about research on depression management and the efficacy of exercise versus mm-hmm. traditional pharmaceuticals. Yeah. Yeah, and this is this finding is really surprising to a lot of people. Um, <laughs> and and I get it. I mean, our our medical system is designed to to treat us with with pills, with drugs, and this is what we're used to. You know, we go to the doctor and they give us a prescription for some medication, and we think that's going to work. And so antidepressants have become one of the most widely prescribed drugs on the planet. And there's a lot of controversy over this, especially for treatment of mild forms that may not even meet clinical diagnosis. And and perhaps what many people don't realize is that there is a there's a group of people that actually don't respond to antidepressants. They're drug resistant antidepressants. And so their depression, they'll they'll take the antidepressants, maybe they'll try a few different varieties, and they just won't work. They won't relieve any of their symptoms. And so where does that leave these people? Well, within the current medical conversation around depression, it doesn't leave them with much options. And this is really, really tragic. But I think the positive note here, the positive message in my book especially is that exercise is the medicine that these individuals need. It's the medicine that we all need. And when we look at the research that compares antidepressant drugs with exercise in a head-to-head challenge, this is going to surprise you, but they're on par. The antidepressant effects of exercise are on par with antidepressants. There's no difference showing how powerful effects antidepressants, uh, the, the effect of exercise is on relieving depressive symptoms. And as a formerly depressed person, I can mm-hmm. attest to yeah. it working. It, I have been, a, well, I've been a lifelong exerciser since I was in my late teens and my depression came on later, but I had already established the habit and I just doubled it when I was in my mm-hmm. funk. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, and it, it is. It's incredible. The relief that you get. And especially for a stress induced depression, it's extremely relieving. It helps prevent the symptoms from getting really, you know, dark, really dire where, you know, it, it keeps them sort of in the mild, more manageable phase. Um, yeah. And I, for me, my issue hasn't been with depression, but it's been with anxiety and OCD and it just works the same too. <laughs> I mean, it's a exercise gift. is my medicine and I just need to do it every day, even if it's just a walk, a walk around the block or, you know, a, a quick run or a quick jog or some yoga some form of movement. I have to do it every day or else I start to feel, I don't know if you feel that, that tension building, you know, the tightness yes. in your chest. Yes. And, um, and so for me, it, it is my medicine. And it's interesting because when you work with an older population, and I'm sure you see this in the lab, when people who have not exercised their whole life and they come in, you know, maybe at more advanced years, how challenging it is for them to move. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. The body just tightens up. I, I've even noticed this over the course of the pandemic. I'm up in Canada and things are a little bit slower to open here. I'm stiff from all this, you know, sitting in front of the computer (laughs) to zoom calls. And so, uh, the first step that I tell people is we need to just break up the sedentary time. We need to move every 30 minutes, just 
a few minute movement break, a two minute movement break, walk around your apartment, your your house, go get a glass of water, maybe walk around the block. There's this trend, these, these silly little walk trend. And it's just, I'm just going for a little walk to the cafe, you know, do those things. Um, because the, the benefit is incredible. So if we sit for too long, blood flow reduces to our brain and this is not good for brain health not it's not good for our mood it's not good for our focus and it's certainly not good for uh, promoting brain health as we age you shared an interesting fact about what was happening during the pandemic in canada and doctors writing prescriptions for mm -hmm. exercise and i would love for you to share that because i did not know this and i mm -hmm. think it's wonderful yeah. So in Canada, the gyms closed as part of the lockdown procedures. And one thing that they did allow was that you could get a medical note from your doctor for, for exercise, for your health. And so I, I jumped on this. Yeah. <laughs> I went to my doctor right away and asked for, you know, prescription. And I said, you know, I need it for, for mental health management as they know. But they were they were still reluctant. I mean, they were it was beautiful that they were prescribing these exercise prescriptions. They were writing it on the prescription pad, but they were reluctant to do it for mental health still. And so they said general health. And so this is really a great step forward, I see. And another cool thing I didn't mention this before was that they can also prescribe, a one year free membership to the national parks to enhance physical and mental health. Wow. Mm -hmm. And is, is that a result of the Japanese studies that were done on nature bathing and the reduction of suicide? Yeah, it's it's partly the impacts of nature on on mental health and well-being, but also the movement. So hiking, being out in nature, being away from technology, all of these things are really beneficial for restoring our mental health. We're going to need to take a break. And when we come back, I have a zillion other questions that I want to I want to ask you and things I want to talk about with you. In the meantime, let's take the break and let me send our listeners to find you at neurofitlab.ca on Twitter at Jennifer Heise. And that's H-E-I-S-Z. We're talking about her book, Move the Body, Heal the Mind, Overcoming Anxiety, Depression and Dementia and Improve Focus, Creativity and Sleep. We're talking with Dr. Jennifer Heise. We'll be right back. And that is a promise. Before we take that pause, let's talk about the importance of self-care and clean living. Taking good care of ourselves and our planet makes good sense. You've heard me talk about how much I love native products. That's because when we take good care of our bodies and the environment, we feel better about ourselves and that makes us happy. All native products are thoughtfully formulated to make clean, simple, and effective personal care. And now, Native is releasing their much-adored deodorants in new and improved plastic-free packaging. Native cares about our bodies and Earth's well-being. Native is a proud partner of 1% for the planet and has committed 1% of its plastic-free deodorant sales to environmental nonprofits. Native has skin in the game because you do too. All native deodorants are aluminum and paraben free that kills odor causing bacteria, provides 24 hour protection to keep you feeling and smelling fresh. Choose from 10 scents, including classic coconut and vanilla. Right now, my personal go-to scent is the lavender and rose in the plastic free packaging. Say yes to environmental friendliness. Be sure to also check out Native's partnership with Baked by Melissa, a limited edition collection that smells good enough to eat, created to make every day a little sweeter, inspired by the signature cupcake sensation. Go Native and level up your self-care routine. Ready to try plastic-free deodorant? Go to nativedeo.com slash harvesting or use promo code harvesting at checkout and get 20% off your first order. That's nativedeo.com dot com slash harvesting or use promo code harvesting at checkout for 20% off your first order. Now let's take that pause. We'll be right back. To learn more about cultivating sustainable well-being at home and the office, visit harvestinghappiness.com and explore Lisa's experiential on-site brain fitness workshops, corporate programming, and speaking engagement services. Hey, 
Hey, hey, hey, we're back. But before we get back to the conversation, I want to talk about the importance of having fun, especially for adults. We work hard and yet we don't always give ourselves the permission or time to play. Everyone deserves a little downtime. When I've got a few minutes to spare, I love to amuse myself with Best Fiends, an exciting puzzle adventure game where you can have fiendish fun anytime and anywhere. Best Fiends is my go-to digital play pal, and I am happily hooked. If you're anything like me, you will be too. Not to brag or anything, but I am kicking some serious butt and about to hit level 7,046. I feel like such a champion. The fun never ends at Best Fiends because there's always fresh content and pop-up challenges to conquer. I pinky swear you'll never be bored or run out of goals to achieve. You'll never be stranded without fun at your fingertips and can even play offline. Don't blame me if you end up kind of obsessed. Need a little digital distraction or some mindful mindlessness? Stress less and play more and add a little more joy to your daily routine. You've Earned your fun time. Go to the App Store or Google Play to download Best Fiends for free. Plus, earn even more with $5 worth of in-game rewards when you reach level 5. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Now let's get back to it. And we're back. Let's get back to the conversation with Dr. Jennifer Heise. We're talking about exercise as the wonder drug. Move the body, heal the brain. Let's get back to it. Okay, Jennifer, let's talk Mm -hmm. a little bit about recovery from substance abuse, because there's Mm -hmm. so much of this in the news today that, you know, mental health challenges are through the roof as Mm -hmm. we are continuing to manage at the end, we hope, of this pandemic. Substance abuse is up. Relapsing is up. Mm -hmm. How can exercise help? Yeah, I mean, uh, this is these go hand in hand, substance use, misuse and mental health. A lot of people who struggle with mental illness turn to substances to help alleviate some of their mental pain, unfortunately. So if you're struggling with a substance use issue, then exercise can help you recover faster. So actually it helps the brain recover faster. It crushes cravings. So even just a 30 minute um, moderate brisk walk is enough to crush your cravings. It gives the brain the dopamine that it needs um, to help rebuild your reward system. Because what happens when we rely on substances is They give the brain way too much dopamine that it can handle. And so the brain's reward system sort of shuts down. It kind of goes into lockdown mode. And the natural pleasures that we get in life no longer give us pleasure. And so the one way that exercise works is it helps to um, rebuild the reward system so that we can get back to enjoying the simpler things in life faster. What a gift. Mm Mm-hmm. It's a beautiful gift. Plus... I mean, if we talk about stress management and anxiety, uh, the exercise lowers stress hormone, right? It lowers cortisol. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So there's this really cool effect of exercise. So exercise is technically a stressor. It's a physical stressor, but it's one that we have full control over. We control when it starts, when it ends, how intense it is. And because of this, we can use it to tone our stress system so that we are better capable of dealing with other stressors in our life. And so, especially at times like this, when stress levels tend to be high because of all the uncertainty, a lot of people can develop new mental illnesses that they never experienced before. These, we call them stress induced mental illness, and they can take the form of depression or anxiety. And people can use exercise to help rebalance, retone their stress system to keep these feelings, these uh, depression and anxiety at bay. I love the word retone. Mm-hmm. That, that that really makes sense. Let's talk a little bit about the connection between exercise and prevention of dementias, because mm-hmm. this is a, another big area of your research. And I want people to listen up. <laughs> <laughs> Exercise is one of the greatest things that you can do to prevent dementia. And uh, one of my favorite studies that we conducted was looking at exercise versus genetic risk. And I think people think of you know dementia as you know being a biological disease. It's in my brain. You know, I don't have much control over it. But that's not true. And our research 
compared exercise, so we looked at physical inactivity versus genetic risk, and we found that physical inactivity contributed to your dementia risk as much as your genetics. And so you can't change your genes, but you can change your lifestyle. And this I think this is one of the most important messages. So by moving more, we can reduce reduce our dementia risk. And I'm not talking about moving a ton. You know, it, this can be a daily walk. And another study that we did in my lab showed that even just interval walking is enough to improve your memory and to keep dementia at bay. So interval walking, what is that? So Lots of people love to go for a daily walk and, you know, you could have a conversation with your friend or your partner and every now and then you just need to pick up the pace to the point that it's difficult to have that conversation. So, you know, your, your heart's racing a little bit and it can even be just between, you know, light posts or adding a hill or two on your route. And this intense burst is enough to give your brain this neuroplasticity that it needs to stay young and healthy. That's great news. And when we talk about the kind or the duration of the exercise, we're not talking about very much, right? You're not suggesting Mm -hmm. that people go into competition training here. No, no. It's your regular daily walk. It can be a 30-minute daily walk that you just increase the intensity a little bit. You know, no fancy equipment required, uh, just a willingness to move the body. And I talk about walking because I most people like walking and it's such an easy thing to incorporate in your life. But it could be cycling. It could be swimming. It could be dancing. It could be yoga. Things that are moving the body are nourishing the mind and helping it to thrive. And increasing one's heart rate a bit, right? It's that little it. that little sort of next level that is what is what is helping us stay mentally fit as well. Right. So to your point about use it or lose it, right? (laughs) If if we stay sort of in our comfort zone, like too comfortable, you know, oh, this is easy. I can do it. Then we're not challenging either our bodies or our minds. So this is the point. We need to continuously challenge ourselves. We need to use it or we'll lose it. Let's talk about the effect that exercise has on sleep because Mm -hmm. people think, Oh, well, if I exercise late in the evening, it's going to wake me up. I won't be able to sleep. And that might be true for some people. However, the research shows there's a direct correlation between Mm -hmm. having good sleep and Mm -hmm. exercise. Yeah. Yeah. So bottom line, the more we move during the day, the better we sleep at night. That's, you know, and it has, it's such, there's actually such a cool link with the science. So the more we move, the more energy we burn. So that's the ATP and the, the byproduct of ATP is adenosine and adenosine builds up and that's what triggers sleep. So the more energy we use during the day, the deeper and better we sleep at night. And, and to your point about exercising just before bed. Now, this is, this is actually somewhat of a myth, I'm going to say, because the the latest research suggests it's not true. There's one caveat, though, that if you're exercising vigorously just before bed to the point that your heart rate remains elevated above sort of your resting state, then that could make take make it take you longer to fall asleep. But otherwise, going for your walk, going for a moderate cycle, going for a swim, all of these things will help promote sleep. And for people who are trying to sleep in a little bit, like if you're an early bird, you can actually, if you exercise at night, it can help you stay awake a little bit longer so that you sleep in a little bit Uh, later during the morning. So a lot of older people tend to wake up really, really early. So this could be a strategy to help them sleep in a little bit more. Oh, I like it. Have Mm -hmm. have a second session even at night. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Speaking about exercise and sleep, I work with a client who is a, a mental health client. He has a lot of challenges. And one of the things that we have him do is that double session. You know, he gets Mm -hmm. very anxious at night. So he hits an elliptical for Mm -hmm. 30 minutes, like around nine o'clock and it helps him settle. Oh, perfect. 
Yeah. It's, it's fantastic. It's been mm -hmm. really a, a game changer for him. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about, I love this one, that exercise can help enhance focus and boost creativity. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Love this. This, is, this, is, <laughs> this is something we all we all need. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this is talking about, you know, back to when I was talking about, you know, we're sitting so much now, uh, taking a few minutes to break up those sedentary time, refuels the brain with the oxygen and, you know, energy it needs to not just think focused, but think creatively. And the thing I love about this research on focus and creativity is research from my lab shown that it's just, you know, a five minute exercise break. We're not talking about, you know, a marathon. We're talking about a five minute movement break and it doesn't really matter the intensity. It can be light, moderate, or uh, high intensity, whatever you like is enough to refuel the brain, reoxygenate it so that you can think better. And the creativity piece is so interesting. This idea that, you know, we have to cross train our body to think more flexibly. So if we move more flexibly and creatively, we think more flexibly and creatively. And so this is why I recommend, you know, not necessarily just doing one activity, but doing a variety of things that you enjoy to do. Love this. I also wonder if stepping away from the screen or stepping away from the desk and changing the view mm -hmm. is also part of it, right? Oh, absolutely. This context shifting. Yeah, for sure. And stepping away, stepping outside, you know, even reshifting the focus so that when we're often in front of a computer screen, we're, it's really close, right? Just even looking off into the distance this helps the brain sort of readjust, reset. I, I'm excited about this research and I'm excited about prescribing this book to every person I know who doesn't move their bodies because mm -hmm. it offers answers. It offers a solution to better health without really doing a whole lot, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I really wanted that book to the book to be a resource for people who aren't moving much or who are intimidated or who have struggled. And I really, my whole goal is to try to have this real compassionate approach because for me, it has been a struggle to find a, a movement and activity that worked for me. And so I wanted to share that struggle. So, you know, people that they don't they don't feel alone in that, you know, it's exercising is hard. It may take time to find what works best for you. But once you find it, this is an incredible resource, an incredible source of strength that you can draw on for the rest of your life. For healthy aging and life extension. Exactly. Exactly. You know, Brain want, health. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's a win all the way around. Go buy this book. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Jennifer Heis has been my guest. We're talking about move the body, heal the mind, overcome anxiety, depression, and dementia, and improve focus, creativity, and sleep, and so on and so on and so on. I mean, the benefits are infinite, really. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, thanks for hanging out. Yeah, it was my pleasure. Thank oh, you. Pl pleasure. To learn more, please visit neurofitlab.ca on Twitter at Jennifer Heis, and that's H-E-I-S-Z. Here comes the pause. We'll be right back. Hang on. Before we take a little break, let's talk about the ease, efficiency, and cost savings of having your favorite high-quality grocery items delivered right to your doorstep. I spend a good amount of time living in a rural environment. That means it's challenging to get the gourmet products I love to cook at local stores in the epicenter of nowhere. That's why I'm a member of Thrive Market, where I get top-notch, carefully vetted provisions. That means everything from healthy pantry essentials to sustainable meat and seafood to non-toxic cleaning and beauty products shipped to my front door. Thrive Market is serious about providing great value and price matches its products. If you find a lower price anywhere, Thrive Market will meet it. 
Now that's great service and that makes me happy. Finding everything you need on Thrive Market is a snap because you can filter your wants and needs by values and lifestyles to find what works best for you and your family. Shop by what you eat and what matters most to you. Thrive Market offers more than 5,000 products to choose from to help keep your family and your home well nourished. My recent order included purely Elizabeth chocolate sea salt granola and Hugh dark chocolate. Yum. So if your lifestyle is plant-based, keto, gluten-free, zero waste, or BIPOC owned brands, Thrive Market has got you covered. And when you join Thrive Market, you're joining me and a community of more than 1 million members strong in paying it forward to sponsor other families in need. Let's not forget about their fast and carbon neutral shipping that is also helping to better our one precious planet. Can your grocery store do that? Join Thrive Market today to get 40% off your first order and a free gift worth over $50. That's T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash harvesting to get 40% off your first order and a free gift worth over $50. That's thrivemarket.com slash harvesting, thrivemarket.com slash harvesting. We'll be right back. And that is a promise. Did you know that happiness is actually good for your health? Happy people live longer, are more productive, and make better partners, parents, and professionals. Connect with us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and follow Lisa on Twitter at Lisa Kamen for a daily dose of inspiration. And we're back talking about exercise as the wonder drug. Move the body, heal the brain. My next guest is Caroline Williams. She is a science writer, journalist, and author. Caroline is a consultant for New Scientist magazine, and her work has also appeared in The Guardian, The Telegraph, The Times, and on the BBC, among others. Caroline is the author of two books, Move and Override. Today, we are talking about Move, how the new science of body movement can set your mind free. Welcome, Caroline. Thanks for joining me on the show today. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, it is a pleasure. Let's talk about your motivation to write Move. I'd love to know what got you here. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a, a sort of a long, circuitous route, really. So way, way back in the midst of time when I first went to university, I wanted to go and study PE teaching. And that wasn't because I was particularly sporty, but in my sort of 17-year-old mind, um, I went through a series of decisions about what kind of life I wanted to live with work. And I thought, well, I don't want to sit around all day. I don't want to be inside. Um, I quite like um, science. So maybe I can do PE with a bit of biology on the side. And <laughs> I, don't know, I couldn't do it that way around. I had to do become a PE teacher and then have science as a second subject. So that's what I did. And then I it wasn't really for me because I wasn't one of the sporty ones in school. I wasn't really into team sports and that at least at the time was what it was all about. And then I went and studied biology, eventually became a science journalist and spent many years being fascinated by the human mind and why we think the way we do and how to get over the various sort of glitches that come with the human brain, you know, lack of focus, um, depression, anxiety, um, creativity, turning up when it feels like it, that sort of thing. I love that you bring up the word creativity in this because we don't often speak about the relationship between exercise and creativity and what happens to us when we step away from our desk or our studio or our lab and we start to move our bodies, which then actually inspires oftentimes, uh, a creativity burst. Yeah, exactly. And that's one of the things that got me from thinking about the brain as if it's something that happened, you know, the mind and the, the mind is the brain is in the head full stop. I, I sort of realized that when I'm stuck on something and I don't understand it or I'm frustrated or need to think something through, the best thing I can do is down tools and go out for a walk. And I started thinking, well, what is it about walking and thinking? How are those 
things connected. And I started thinking a bit more broadly, thinking, well, okay, so I never feel more focused and calm than when I've done an hour of yoga. And, you know, why does jumping around in the kitchen make me feel really happy? You know, what is going on between the body and the brain and and how that affects the way we think and feel? And so that's what brought me to move in the end, you know, going sort of full circle from a career based on movement to science, the brain, and then back to the body again. And it sort of all seems to have come together in a way that I didn't expect, really. Well, it's it's free medicine. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I think that's the, the joyful part of all of this is, you know, that we look better, we feel better, but that it, it's free. You know, there's really, it's not very complicated. And yet there are a lot of complications to get ourselves to move regularly, right? That we, you and I talked about that before we started recording this interview. But Talk a little bit about what happens in the brain, because it's my understanding that when we move, particularly when we go out in nature, that we are activating both sides of our brains. Well, I mean, the thing about the the sort of right brain, left brain thing, there's a kernel of truth in there somewhere, but it's sort of it, our brains are, are connected with a great big mesh of neuro of, of a pathways that keeps the left and right talking to each other all the time. So, but what it does do is it there's there's many many things it does it does things to our psychology and it think does things to our brain so basically our brains evolved to inform our movements in the world and so when for example when we're moving forward through space that affects our perception of time so we tend to think that the past is sort of behind our backs and the future is in front of us. And as we're moving forward through space, that sort of feels like we're moving away from the past and moving into the future. And that can bring a sort of sense of, you know, figurative progress as well as literal progress. And that is one of the reasons why moving forward under your own steam can help you feel like you're getting somewhere. And it's kind of hard to to ruminate and feel depressed when you're physically getting somewhere. So, so there's that going on. There's also, um, there's, we all know about endorphins and the kind of chemical changes that happen when we exercise, but there are some kind of newer ones that I found when I was researching this book. And one is that our feet have sort of almost pressure sensors built in. And when we're moving on our feet, that sets up sort of turbulence in our blood vessels, which sends a boost of blood to the brain. And in experiments, it seems that when we sort of time our footsteps with our heartbeat, so they synchronize at sort of 120 steps and 120 beats per minute was this kind of sweet spot where we get the biggest boost of blood to the brain. And and the researcher doing this work said, well, maybe this underlines one of the reasons why exercise and walking or running makes you feel really good. So there's 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 all kinds of various things. There's hormones released from the bone that go into the brain that improve memory and reduce anxiety. The, uh, the, the whole body and brain is built so that when we're moving, we think and feel better. There's There's so much going on. It's unbelievable. Go back to the feet for a minute, because I have never heard this before. And I find this so fascinating. So what I'm hearing you say is that happy feet... <laughs> <laughs> really, really are happy feet for a reason that, that, that the function of the, of the feet in helping to bring more blood up to the brain is what is making us feel better. So the impact. Yeah, possibly. Well, we, we, so far, so this is quite new research. A lot of the stuff that I've sort of found in the book is quite new. Um, and so there were some really cool experiments planned that got sort of push, pushed back because of COVID, which is a real shame. But what we know so far is that when we put pressure on our feet and move, then that does send, I think it's something like 20% extra um, boost of blood flow to the brain. And that's quite a new thing. So we thought for a long time that when we exercise, the, you know, the brain's got various sort of valves and safety catches. So you don't want too much blood going to the brain. And there's a reason why when you go upside down, you, you know, you don't completely get a, a rush of blood to the head because it's very tightly controlled. But within that, there is some wiggle room for a little bit of extra boost. And it's possible that that's why you feel so good. You're getting more oxygen, more uh, glucose, more more of all the good stuff that the brain needs to function at its best. And there was another beautiful nugget you shared about the chemicals that are released, you said, from the bones? Yeah. So that really surprised me because I think everyone knows about endorphins, you know, know, happy hormones and things like that. But yeah, there's another... um, well, I mean, we, who thinks of, of their bones as releasing hormones? I mean, I I didn't. And so, you know, we tend to think of them as dry sticks that hold our bodies up. But actually, they're 
they're a living tissue. They're constantly remodeling themselves. And when we um, move against gravity, then they're building themselves up to cope with that stress. And then if we don't, they break down. And one of the things that happens when they're building themselves up, when we've when we've taxed them, is they release this hormone called osteocalcin. And for many years, researchers were thinking, well, what, what does this hormone do? It must be doing something in building the bone. And it turned out it wasn't doing anything to actually build the bone. But while that process was happening, it was going into the blood and connecting with the areas in the brain, the hippocampus, which is to do with memory and learning um, and improved memory and learning this is in in mouse studies initially but there's wow. some 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 studies coming through in humans as well um yeah so it seems to improve memory and decrease ang anxiety like behaviors um so it's really really interesting that this movement um is linked to learning and it kind of it makes sense if you think about evolutionary history as hunter gatherers you know you want to be out you, that the evolutionary pressure is to be able to move around for long periods of time, be on your feet, be fit and healthy, but also to be able to think, to remember, to work together. You know, the cognitive side of that is really important. And so sort of through our evolution, we've sort of tied these things together to the point where when we move, this all works better. And if we don't, then the body and the brain all work together to cut back on capacity. So our bones get weaker. And our brains don't work as well. So the whole thing is, is is connected so that one feeds into the other. Fascinating. I, I want to talk a little bit about problem solving, because I know that when I've got to solve a problem, best to hit the road. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And there, there's, um, you know, there's a long history of people walking for thinking. And it's something that, you know, so Charles Darwin did. Um, and you can actually visit uh, people in the UK, if any listeners in the UK, you can visit Charles Darwin's house in Kent in the countryside. And he came back from the Voyages of the Beagle with all this information about, you know, Galapagos finches and they had different beaks. And he, he had the form, he had the idea uh, of evolution, but he couldn't quite nail it down into a sort of coherent um, argument. And then he decided to move out of London to the countryside. And the first thing he did when he got there is to build what he called his thinking path. And he just walked around there um, four or five times a day. It was a quarter of a mile path going along some fields and back through some woodlands. And he would just walk and think and walk and think. And it's there that he finally finally got the headspace to come up with, you know, what we now know is a theory of evolution. And there's some really interesting research on the brain that that, that explains why that's a good strategy. And so we already know that the frontal bits of the brain, which are the bits behind the forehead, they for, for creative thinking, they need to be temporarily turned down because these are the bits of the brain that think in straight lines. They go for the obvious and they just, you know, most of the time they keep us on the straight and narrow and not being inappropriate. <laughs> <We> help anyways. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Some of us, not so much. But, you know, if we want to think outside the box, then we need to turn the, you know, this, this, this activity down. And in the lab, and I've had this done, it was quite fascinating. You can you can add electrical stimulation to this part of the brain, turn activity down, and people become way more creative. I came up with some ridiculous ideas under this stimulation. But the good news is you don't need to be stimulated with an electric battery. You can just go for a walk and or, or move in any way that you find sort of easy that allows your mind to wander. And it gets you into this state where um Rather than thinking in straight lines, you're sort of bringing things from from all different angles and putting them together in, in new ways. So it, it's the ideal it's the ideal state to be in for problem solving because you might put two and two together in ways that you'd never done before uh, and come up with a new solution. So yeah, absolutely, you're right. Your your intuition is right. Whenever you're stuck, go out and move. Walk, think on the move. We need to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to continue the conversation with Caroline Williams. We're talking today about Exercise the Wonder Drug. Her newest book is Move, How the New Science of Body Movement Can Set Your Mind Free. To learn more, please visit carolinewilliams.net, on Twitter at Science Caroline, and on Instagram, carolinewilliams underscore science. Here comes the pause. We'll be right back. And that is a promise. Who says money can't buy happiness? Whether you are a skeptic or seeker, check out Lisa's new book, Are We Happy Yet? Eight Keys to Unlocking a Joyful Life, a boot camp manual for greater emotional fitness, is available at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, IndieBound, and HarvestingHappiness.com. 
Here's a truth bomb. Emotions are contagious, and happiness is a universally desired state. But we tend to forget that we all have the freedom to be happy or the liberty to be miserable each day, regardless of external circumstances. Explore the journey of human happiness, how to find it and keep it, with Lisa's documentary film, H Factor. Where is your heart? Visit HarvestingHappiness.com to learn more. Talking with Caroline Williams about exercise as the wonder drug. Move the body, heal the brain. Let's get back to it right now. So, Caroline, you so enthusiastically described how walking could be good for problem solving. I'd love to turn the conversation now to emerging links between core exercise and stress control, because Lord knows we need it. Absolutely. And and this one, I, I it really resonates with me because so far, most of the solutions for stress are very much brain based. They're like, just think differently, take, you know, take some time, you know, stop panicking, you know, which which is great. And I guess that's sensible, but it doesn't necessarily always work. So I went to visit some researchers in Pittsburgh who have been tracing the neural pathway. So basically the body's wiring diagram from the adrenal glands, which sit on top of our kidneys. Um, and they wanted to know where those connections ended up in the brain. So which bits of the brain are talking to our adrenal glands. And when they trace those connections back, they turned up in the part of the brain that controls voluntary movement. So um, the motor cortex, it's like an, an Alice band, you can imagine, over the top of your head. And within that region, where most of the connections turned up, were in the parts of the motor cortex that move the core. So there's something about moving in general that is connected to our stress consult control system. And specifically moving the core, which is really interesting because on the one hand, you know, we've, we've got lots of evidence that things like Pilates and yoga and Tai Chi are stress relieving. Um, but also we know that posture matters for how you feel. You know, if you, you're sitting all scrunched up, you, you feel less powerful, less able. And if you're stand, sitting with your chest open and you're, you know, you're holding your body up, then you feel much better. And so this is a really interesting connection that's just coming through that maybe um, by engaging our core, by sitting up straight, by doing something to strengthen and challenge our core, we can actually t tell our stress system that we're in control and turn that whole sort of stress valve down a little bit. So I love this because it means that you don't have to just talk yourself out of being um, in a bit of a mess. Maybe you can do something physical that, that will do at least as well, if not better. And it's interesting that you share this because when you think about the gut, you know, being thought of as, a, as another brain in the body, that when we are strengthening this part of ourselves, that we are also strengthening another brain. Yeah, there's, there's also um, some research into, you know, the, the, the sense that we have, we have a sense of being in our bodies looking out from a container. And, and so some researchers say that, well, maybe that's because all of our internal organs are in this sort of core region. And so this is where some of the signals come from, the beating of the heart, the digestive system, all these signals that go to our brain that it, the sense is called interoception. It's a sense of how things are going on the inside of the body. All of this stuff is in the same sort of region. So it would make sense that the messages about how things are going um, and whether we should rev things up or calm down would at least partly come from this part of the body. So it's really intriguing. And I, I'm keeping a good eye on this research to see where they go next with it, because oh, I think yeah. it's fascinating. It is fascinating. You used a term that I am unfamiliar with called the Alice Band. And I would love for you to just define that. Oh, is that maybe that doesn't translate into, into American English. So like a hairband that goes over the top of your head or say if you imagine you're wearing big uh, headphones. Ah, got it. Like Alice in Wonderland, she has got, a hairband. Got it. Got it. Yeah, now, yeah. now I'm up to speed. 
yeah. <laughs> things like that when the American edition came out. I was like, oh, right, that makes no sense. Okay, it's good. The yeah. Alice Band. Okay, but now we know. We've had, this is like the new phrase of the day, your Alice Absolutely. Band. Absolutely. You can all have that one from me. <laughs> yes, that's a freebie. <laughs> Let's talk about moving from sort of that core exercise, core strength and stress control to the links between physical strength and resilience and our self-esteem and self-confidence. Yes, this is a really important one because strength training is the one thing that's really easy to neglect, especially I think women, because historically we've been discouraged from doing it in case we get too beefed up or whatever. But there's really, really <laughs> too beefed up. Yeah, there's really strong evidence, and it has been around for a really long time since the late 80s, that improving physical strength is really, really effective in increasing, in, in boosting self esteem decreasing anxiety, symptoms of depression, you know, resilience in general. Um, and so I'm thinking specifically of this 80s study with some teenage girls where they improved their physical strength by 40% over 12 weeks. And then they spoke to the girls about how they were feeling and they reported feeling much more capable in walks of life that had nothing to do with physical strength, you know, just being able to take their place in a room, have a dif have a difficult conversation, just feel that they had things in hand. Um, and this goes back to the interoception thing I mentioned just now, that we've got this constant updating of signals from our body that tells our brain how things are going and how capable we are of acting and being successful in the world. And, and if we're physically stronger, the background messaging that we're sort of giving off from our body is basically, everything's fine, I can handle this. And, and it seems to feed into a sense of confidence, you know, lack of anxiety and just feeling better and feeling like you can cope. So this is a thing that psychologists call global self-efficacy, which is just a way of saying, yeah, I can handle it. So strength training is incredibly important, um, especially from middle age onwards, but, but for everybody. And go back to another term that you used. I, I, I like that I can pick your brain about some of these terms. Intraception. Yeah. So this is a, it's becoming really important in uh, mental health research. So it's the idea that so we build up our sense of how we feel in the moment, not just from the brain. So thoughts and emotions don't only come from the brain. We're constantly unconsciously monitoring what's going on in the body. So from the heartbeat to the squelching in the gut to the, you know, the, the strength of our muscles to whether we're hungry. So all of this information that's kind of coming in at different timescales is constantly being integrated by the brain to kind of give up this, this sort of ongoing picture of how you feel in the moment. And that's becoming really important in mental health research because some people are more sensitive to some of these signals than others. Some people are less good at identifying them. And some people have different thresholds at which one of these messages sets off another. So for example, if you have a heart rate, if your heart rate starts to race, some people have stress hormones ramp up at a lower level of heart rate rise than other people. So there's all these individual differences that might feed into mental health issues. And it's really fascinating area. But but you know, just in general, our body is constantly talking to to our brain and giving this sort of um, one researcher calls it that sort of background music to our life. So much like when you're watching a film and, you know, you, you start to feel on edge for reasons that you can't quite put your finger on. It's the background music that's making you feel edgy. It's that sort of thing. It's sort of bubbling along and you don't, you're not necessarily aware of it all the time, but it can really color the way you feel. And, and movement can change those messages in the moment. And like with stress, strength training, you can change them for the longer term as well so that those messages are a bit stronger, a bit more robust. Well, I will be writing about this. <laughs> 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 this is great. It's very interesting. Yeah. yeah. And it's interoception. So it's interoception. It, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. Yes. Fabulous. We're nearly out of time and I want to get on to another one of my favorite happy subjects, and that is the power of dance. Yes. Dance is, it's a very much a human thing. You know, there, there's no other animal we know of that dances that like we do, or at least if they do, they're dancing at a different rhythm that we can't pick up. Um, so it's very much a human thing. And there's various theories about why it evolved, but we know that it's been with humans for a really long time. You know, we have cave paintings of people dancing. Um, and one of the ideas is that 
it helps to bring us together and to feel closer to other people. And so the neuroscience behind this is one idea is that as we're moving our bodies in space, you know, we have this from our sense of our bodily movements. We know where our limbs are in space and that helps you see where, you know, where your body begins and ends. If you're dancing in synchrony with other people, the information about their body movements, which is coming in from the eyes, kind of gets a little bit mixed up with the senses from within our own body to the point where you don't quite have this boundary between what's me and what's you anymore. And so we feel more connected. Um, and that, that's one idea for why moving with other people, it just feels really good. We start to care about them more and we feel at one. And, you know, there's been all these kind of cool experiments done with with toddlers where if you bounce them on your knee, in time to the music and then you'd put them down and accidentally drop something they will pick it up and hand it back to you they're far more likely to do that if you've bounced them in time with music than if you bounce them out of time and and wow. even in adulthood you can get people to play games where they, they you know they tap along together and then get them to do a game where they can either compete or they can work together and people cooperate much better if they have been moving together in time beforehand. So there's something sort of visceral bonding, some people call it, that, you know, there's something very something very connecting about moving with people. And whether that's dance or whether it's aerobics or or yoga or tai chi or, you know, whatever it is that you like to do or drumming, then it, it does bring people together. And it's a very powerful way of doing that. Plus, it's just great fun. And, yeah. You know, yeah, I mean, there's also really interesting stuff about the balance organs of the inner ear and that they are linked to um, the parts of the brain that uh, process emotions. So when we're, when we're dancing, when we're sort of taking ourselves off balance and catching ourselves, that gives us a little a boost of pleasure, you know, so that we, we feel good in the same way that when someone sets up a joke and we expect it to go one way and, and then, you know, they pull the rug out and, and we laugh. It's a bit like that, but with movement. And so some, you know, just j jumping around in the kitchen to movement could just make you feel really good. Um, it's the same reason we like to, you know, go down slides and go on swings and all that kind of thing. Just moving around and sort of not falling over is a, is a sense of, of, happiness. So we should all do it more often. We should do it more often and, and with wild abandon because it's, it's kind, free, legal, and it's the, <laughs> the, the, the sort of the key to helping us better manage our, our minds and our bodies. I mean, there's, yeah. there is absolutely no downside except the challenges of motivating yourself to move your body, which that's why we have pets and partners. Yeah. And you know, you don't even have to do it with other people. You can do it, you know, my, most of my dancing these days happens in the kitchen whilst clearing up after dinner or whilst cooking, crank the, 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 the music up and just kind of jump around for a bit. And um, yeah, it still works. Get out and move. That's, <laughs> that's the challenge of the day, you know, get out there and move your body. To learn more about Caroline Williams, please visit carolinewilliams.net on Twitter at Science Caroline and on Instagram, Caroline Williams underscore science. Caroline, thanks for hanging out with me. I now want to go put on some good like drum beat music and <laughs> prance around my office. <laughs> Yeah, do it. It's, it's the only way to get from this part of the day to the next part of the day. Take a quick dance break. Indeed. Thanks for joining us on Harvesting Happiness today. This is Lisa cypress Cayman on behalf of my guests, Dr. Jennifer Heise and Caroline Williams, wishing you kind thoughts, kinder words, and the kindest of actions. Until next time, remember, happiness is an inside job. Happiness is your inside job. Please go out and rock your day. Keep harvesting your own happiness anytime and anywhere from the comfort of wherever you are. Subscribe, listen, and share hundreds of downloadable episodes via our free app or from our libraries at toginet.com, iTunes, Google Play, and other fine podcast platforms. To learn more about Lisa's global consulting services, please visit harvestinghappiness.com. Spread more joy by liking us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and following Lisa on Twitter at Lisa Kamen. Harvesting Happiness is produced in collaboration with TogiNet Radio, KBUU Radio Malibu.net, and is available on PRX, the public radio exchange.